Good morning, Riverwood, and happy Sunday. Even in the middle of a pandemic, we are so very blessed. That doesn't make everything perfect, does it? And it certainly doesn't mean that we don't have problems. But we are loved by an ever-merciful, ever-faithful Father who watches over us and gave His Son in an amazing sacrifice. Praise be to Him. We've got a special treat today for our kids. If you'll hang around towards the end of this video, Matt and some members of the youth group got together and did a couple of kids sing songs for you. So we hope that you'll join in on that. Big kids, you can join in too. Let's keep praying for each other. Let's keep praying for those that are lost. And let's keep praying for an end to this pandemic. We long to be together. And we miss you so very much. Let's join in worship together. We will worship the Lamb of glory. We will worship the King of kings. We will worship the Lamb of glory. We will worship the King. We bless the name of the Lamb of glory. We bless the name of the King. Your home. 
As a church family, we cannot help but be distracted each day by COVID-19. We must be aware of its possible effects on those around us and ourselves. Therefore, it is not difficult to find fault with the world and maybe even struggle to find gratitude and thanksgiving in what we see and hear each day. But bringing glory to God through words and actions of gratitude and thanksgiving are things that please Him. So with that in mind, let us go to our Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have so much respect for you and are in awe of all that you do for us as your children. Thank you for blessing us as a church family with opportunities to share and worship. Thank you for giving us our small groups and other ways to stay connected to one another and you. We are thankful for the successful surgeries of our members who are now healing. We are thankful for your being with our youth during their camp as well as other times together. Thank you for safe travels of so many of our families. We are also thankful for ways we have to reach out to each other while separated. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit as we pray for the future of Riverwood Church. We pray for more sense of community as we seek ways to connect, showing love for each other and for those who are not part of our church family. We ask for awareness of opportunities and the right words to share your son's teachings with those we know and those we have yet to meet. Please continue to bless us as we seek to walk closer to you every day. And it is in your son's name that we make this prayer, thanking you for allowing us to come to you with our thanksgiving and request. Amen. Well, good morning, church. We are glad to be with you this morning as we enter into this time of communion and share this together. Um, and as we begin to focus our minds and hearts, um, just thinking about what communion is, the significance of it, the importance of it, what are some of those things that, that stand out to you about communion, Lindsay? Uh, I know every day we have so many thoughts that go through our minds, so many things that might be uh, on our to-do list or things we have to accomplish in a day. And I think just taking time to stop those thoughts and to slow down and to refocus on Jesus and um, his love for us and his sacrifice for us is really important. And I love the times that we get to do that as a church family, like right now. Yeah, and, and it's also one of those times where we're reminded of, of something special that was given to us. And maybe even makes me think about something that just happened uh, for us uh, uh, Saturday morning, and we had a FedEx driver pull in the driveway and uh, got a package out and came and left it on our front porch. And I remember just kind of wondering, well, what is that? What have I ordered? I, I don't remember ordering anything. And 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 why why is that box sitting out there? Did they deliver it at the wrong house? You know, or something like that. So I went and got it. And I was like, no, my my name's on it, so it was for me. And got the box in the house and opened it up, and lo and behold. It was something that I totally forgot that that we had uh, kind of had been waiting on now for a couple months that I'd even totally forgot that that we had had ordered, you know, and and didn't even realize that that it was still going to be coming. Oh, 
uh, Haiti team, it's the t-shirts from the Children of the Promise fundraiser. So you'll be getting your t-shirts soon. And, and and so that that was just such an unexpected surprise there, unexpected gift, but it connected me to something from the past, or reminded me of something that had happened in the past. And uh, it, it makes me think of, of a passage in Isaiah, in chapter 53, um, in Isaiah's description of what God gave up for us and, and what Jesus went through for us that, yeah, he, he talked about it back then, but, but in the present, it has so much more significance when we realize exactly all that was given up, all that was given for us and, and, and why and the love that was shown in and through that. And so Lindsay's going to share that with us uh, right now. Who has believed our message? To whom will the Lord reveal his saving power? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, sprouting from a root in dry and sterile ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterness and grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we were healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins? that he was suffering their punishment. He had done no wrong, and he never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and fill him with grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children, many heirs. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's plan will prosper in his hand. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of one who is mighty and great, because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among those who were sinners. He bore the sins of many and interceded for sinners. What a beautiful passage that is, but what a great reminder of what we did, of what we've done. The fact that our weakness, our sin had to be dealt with. And God saw fit to deal with that through Christ, that he put all of that, that pressure, put all of that, that, that guilt put all of that sin on him to the point that he he experienced wounding, that he was he was crushed, that he was led to the slaughter, to be put to death, so that we can have life. And so as we go through this time right now, as we go through each and every day, what an important thing it is to be reminded of all that was done for us, of that beautiful, that precious, that unexpected, that unearned, that undeserved gift that was given for us. So let's pray. And as I pray um, to to bless this time together, I encourage you uh, to, to take some time and maybe even talk a little bit about what this experience is for you, why communion is so important to you, and share with each other the strength uh, the the love, um, the empowerment, um, and even the boldness that that you were able to draw from, and uh, the joy uh, that you were able to find because of all that was given for us. Let's pray. Dear God, what a wonderful God you are. <laughs> what an amazing God you are, in your willingness to go to such lengths in your willingness 
to allow your son to be treated the way he was treated for us. To bear all that he had to bear, to experience all that he had to experience, to be oppressed in the way he was oppressed, to be crushed. <laughs> that was your doing. That was your will. That was your desire because of your love for us. And so God, as we take time now to reflect on that, to be reminded of the magnitude of that, as we take this bread, to remind us of all that Jesus did, all that Jesus went through of his earthly life right here. As we take the cup to draw in a measure of righteousness, of, of, of cleansing so that we can be with you, God. I pray that we allow ourselves to fully embrace all that this is, all that this means, and all that we have because of you and because of what you have done for us. God, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, today's reading is taken from Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. It's 14's in here somewhere. Take two. <laughs> Try it again. I can cut. Oh, there we go. Uh, actually, 14 starts kind of in the middle of a sentence. So you want me to start with 13? I think 14 is still fine. Just, just forget the and. Okay. <laughs> Today's reading is taken from Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sounds of the horn, flute, zither, lair, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are not ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I'm trying during these crazy days of online services, general uncertainty about when we can assemble back together at the building, to try to share some lessons that really fulfill two goals. First, I'm looking for messages that are helpful to face the mess that we all are in. And then secondly, I'm trying to use well-known passages that we can easily apply to that situation. Within that vein, I want us today to talk about the story of the fiery furnace. I think that's one that almost all of us have heard from early on in Sunday school. It's a favorite of just about every well-rounded vacation Bible school program. The details are pretty straightforward. Remember a few months ago when we were studying the Jewish exile? Well, these are the people who are from that era, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There are three of those who were taken over from Jerusalem to Babylon. Along with Daniel, they're selected for some special attention. They're invited into Nebuchadnezzar's court. They're to be trained in the ways of the Babylonians. A couple of purposes for this. First, the Babylonians want to be able to gain information and insight from the peoples that they've conquered. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What cultural ideas and concepts might they borrow? What hindrances might exist to their blending into the Babylonian world? By bringing representative men in and interacting with them, 
They can discover all of this and more. But it works the other way too. The men will come to understand how the Babylonian system works. They'll be able to communicate details of this back to their people. So they become, in a sense, ambassadors for these foreign captors to the Jewish nation. Now, uh, there will be, just by nature, some cultural conflicts. And they're not always going to be proven. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel, whom the Babylonians call Belshazzar, he's immediately confronted with an issue. He's trying to maintain what we would today call a kosher diet. The Babylonians, they don't. As a compromise, there's going to be a bit of a contest between the diet of those who stay on the Levitical restriction and those who eat what the Babylonians do. And of course, if you'll remember, those on the Levitical diet win. But there are other areas of conflict that do not avail themselves to such an easy resolution. Later in the book of Daniel, the prophet is going to be forced to violate a law about prayer. His failure to follow that instruction will land him in the lion's den. That's another one of those stories we all know from vacation Bible school, Daniel chapter 6. The key for us this morning is another example of the difficult conflicts that are faced by the Jews while in captivity. The king, you see, wants to use the worship of this large statue to build national unity. An edict is drafted to mandate that everyone must worship. And a failure to bow down to the image will result in death. Well, that's what's assumed. So the representatives of all the captured nations of the Babylonians are gathered before this image. And the music starts and everyone is to bow down to worship as they're instructed except for the three Jewish young men. Now, Daniel, he's not mentioned. We all know if he wasn't present, if he bowed down, it, we're just not told. Anyway, the focus is on the three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They speak with King Nebuchadnezzar. He gives them an ultimatum, which they reject. Now, furious, the king commands that this furnace be stoked seven times hotter, and that Shadrach, Meshach, and again Abednego be tightly tied and thrown into the now superheated furnace. And this is done in chapter 3, verse 22 of the book of Daniel. However, as you will recall from all those flannel boards, uh, the three are unheard. Instead, they're freed from their ropes and they're joined by a fourth figure, often thought to be Jesus before the Incarnation, and they're all just casually strolling around, walking around in the flames. The king calls out to them to come out, and they do so. And to the amazement of all who have witnessed this, they aren't burned, why they don't even have the smell of smoke. It's an amazing miracle. Now, in the reading, which gives their words before this experience, they lay out before the king two possibilities. First, they observe that they may be delivered from the fiery trial that they will soon experience. That God could save them out of it. Or, he could save them through it. They would die in the flames, but they would have the victory either way. And they would have trusted God who would be with them no matter what. Here in Daniel 3, it is the former that occurs. They are unharmed by the fire. And I'll remind you of last week's lesson where Jesus and the disciples, they're out on the Sea of Galilee. This furious storm arises. And in the midst of the squall, Jesus is awakened and calms the sea. Peace be still. They are delivered from out of the danger. And we all really like these stories. 
I, I mean, that's often our prayer, isn't it? Lord, sister, whomever has cancer, God, please heal her. God, this pandemic is taking such a high toll on people. There are folks who are dying. Medical workers are just stressed out. There's all that uncertainty about when school is going to start in a bit. Uh, there's our hesitancy in meeting together. Lord, just end it. Just heal it. Dear God, we're all so frustrated by what's happening with folks who have dementia and Alzheimer's. God, restore them. Those are our prayers. But the three Jewish young men in Daniel 3 point to another option which we can experience as God's children. While true that God may deliver us out of it, it is also the case that He can choose to deliver us through it. Here's something that you may not have considered, but both kinds of deliverance are miraculous. It's God acting either way, right? But let's admit it. We like it best when God delivers us out of it so we don't have to walk through it. Again, I take you back to last week's lesson. In that storm, Jesus stood. He spoke to the storm, causing it to cease. But the Bible is filled with stories of others who didn't receive such a deliverance but were called to walk through their trial. Now, you have to ask, why? Why doesn't God deliver us every time? Well, why require us to walk through it? Why not just send an angel or two to whisk us all away? After all, that's what I would do if I were God. I want to answer those questions by showing some of the reasons why God chooses to walk us, as David said in the great Psalm 23, through the valley of the shadow. First, I, I think God acts in this way so that we might learn to trust Him. Trusting God doesn't come easy. We can't see God. We can't touch Him. We can't hear His voice the way we do others. Further complicating our trust in God is the fact that for many of us, we have experienced deep wounding from people that we thought we could trust. For some of you, it may be a parent who abused you physically or emotionally. According to the statistics, it's pretty likely that someone listening to our service today was inappropriately touched by a friend or relative. You trusted them, they violated that trust. You might have had some friends at school or church, and they turned on you. You had a girl or boyfriend or maybe even a spouse who was unfaithful. The result of any such experience is to teach us not to trust. Now because of these events, some of us either have had or maybe even still have walls that have been built up in our soul that no one can. There's a sign posted over the door of our heart that reads, Keep Out. Therefore, we would never learn to trust God unless we were placed in situations that pressured, that forced us to do it. I think of the children of Israel. They passed through what the Bible calls a great and terrible wilderness. Moses uses that language in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15 and 19. He's talking about the 40 years of wandering in the desert. He says that God led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. The whole 40 years that Israel journeyed through the wilderness, God was trying to teach them a simple lesson of trust. I will feed you. 
I will care for you. I will provide for you. And the truth is, they never learned it. At the juncture of every trial, Israel freaked out. They fell into complaining. They failed to trust God. Because they never learned to trust God, a large percentage of them missed the promise. Now, Paul says these things were written in the Bible for our sakes. These things happen, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. The Apostle Paul wrote about an especially difficult trial that he and his team experienced in Asia that brought him and taught him about new levels of trust in God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. Facing this trial was not Paul's choice. He was placed into this circumstance by God for the purpose of learning the lesson. And oh, don't miss the fact that this matter was beyond his ability to endure. Paul is revealing that this trial was the only way he would ever have learned to trust God. Totally. Now, the second reason that God chooses to walk us through difficulties is that we can become a blessing to others. One of God's plans is that we would help people in our future that are hurting like we are right now. I like the way Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-4, through 4, the New Living Translation. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. When I was working at the Highland View Church in Oak Ridge, the leadership there maintained what they called a pain bank. It was basically a referral network of individuals who had faced trauma and through the grace of God had emerged from the other side. Now, whether part of a formal program or not, someone in need is waiting on the other side of your trial. Who can help someone that loses a loved one better than someone who has been comforted by God in the loss of a loved one? Who can hold a struggling alcoholic's hand better than the person who's walked through alcoholism and triumphed in Jesus? Who can comfort a broken-hearted parent whose child has gone into wild rebellion better than a parent who's walked through the same thing and has seen God's goodness and faithfulness? God never wastes a pain, but will use it to make us ministers to others. Finally, I think God chooses to walk us through our trials to bring about a testimony to a skeptical world. Back to our original text. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are not delivered from the fiery trial, but were delivered in it as Nebuchadnezzar cast them into the oven. And the Bible said... God used it to reveal himself to the king. Consider Daniel chapter 3, verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar says, 
prays to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent His angel to rescue His servants who trusted Him. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Someone is always watching the way. Professing Christians walk through the God, through the trials that God allows. When we trust Him, and He walks us through the valley of the shadow to the other side, it testifies to the reality of God that we profess to know. When we face this coronavirus with a confident peace, it speaks volumes to the world around us. When we join together with our black brethren to stand arm in arm to overcome racism, don't think for a moment that non-Christians don't notice. They do. And how we walk through the trials of life says something very dramatic to the skeptics in our culture who want to say that our faith is real. So God can deliver us from difficulties. It's good and proper to pray those prayers. But we need to also see that God may often allow us to walk through those trials. And when he does so, three results may occur. He can teach us to trust him. He can make us a blessing to others. And he can bring a testimony to a skeptical world that our God is real and faithful. Work alongside God through the difficulties he brings your way. Make it a great week. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to Father. Good morning, Riverwood. I hope you are doing well this morning, and we miss being able to be together. Uh, but it is truly a blessing um, to worship such an amazing God, and to be able uh, to come 
together even virtually uh, this morning and, and to do that. And so I hope you were blessed this morning. Uh, you know, I was reminded uh, when reading through Scripture and reading through John uh, this week, and, and I love how the book of John ends where he says, And Jesus did many other things. And I suppose that if it was all written down, there wouldn't be enough books to contain it. Isn't that so amazing? I mean, to think that, that Jesus had done so many other incredible works, uh, and miracles, uh, and ways that he influenced others. Uh, so many that we, the world couldn't even contain telling all of them. And isn't it true for our life? Uh, even, even many times when we don't uh, see or understand how God may be working in something, He is. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to know that. So I hope you are encouraged this week. I hope you um, are taking time uh, to slow down and turn uh, to His Word and to pray and to lean on His understanding, not our own. And I hope you're encouraged uh, because we serve an amazing God who loves us so much. So stay strong. Stay strong in your faith and stay strong in, in leaning on Him and relying on Him. This morning for announcements, I have a, a few helpers who are going to help uh, share our prayer list. Uh, please remember all of those on the prayer list. Uh, please um, just continue to lift up each other in your prayers. Reach out to each other. Uh, also, I, I encourage you um, to pray for, for all the kids who will be starting back school and teachers and staff and what an adjustment that will be. So please remember them in your prayers uh, this week. <laughs> please pray for Brenda Bailey and Linda Boyd. Miss Misty Bucknell, Nelda Clement, Boyles Finney, Molly Fox, Doug Morgan, Corey, and Dad. Ray Stevens. Will Terry. Santa Woodra. Please pray for all these people. We miss you. We miss you and we love you. Good morning, boys and girls. We've got some of us here who are going to help us sing some songs. It's been a while since we've been able to do kids sing. So we wanted to sing with you guys this morning. I got Emma, I got Lydia Kay, I got Ella and Levi. And we want you to sing out really loud with us. All right, let's start out with some Lord's Army. Is right, everybody ready? I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. All right, now we're going to do cowboy style. You ready to do cowboy style, guys? All right, ready. Get, get ready. Get ready. Get your, get your uh, cowboy belt loops, and here we go. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yeehaw! I'm in the Lord's army. Yeehaw! I'm in the Lord's army. Yeehaw! I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yeehaw! All right, and now we're going to do pirate style. 
pirate style. All right, this this we haven't done this for very much, so uh, bear with us. Here we go. I may never sail across the seven seas, sit in the captain's seat, on my shoulder hear a parrot squeak. I may never lift up my patch to see, but I'm in the Lord's army. Ahoy, matey! I'm in the Lord's army. Ahoy, matey! I'm in the Lord's army. Ahoy, matey! I may never sail across the seven seas, sit in the captain's seat, on my shoulder hear a parrot squeak. I may never lift up my patch to see, but I'm in the Lord's army. Ahoy, matey! All right, good job. Now we're going to do one that's one of my favorites, um, uh, If You Love Jesus. All right, here we go. If you love Jesus, if you love Jesus, clap your hands, clap your hands. Na 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 Suck it to the devil. If you love Jesus, if you love Jesus, nod your head, nod your head. Na 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 Suck it to the devil. If you love Jesus, if you love Jesus, do all four. Do all four. Suck it to the devil. All right. Thank you for being here with us, and we hope to see you back next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>